Hey everyone, and welcome to another installment of Jag Tagger 93 Remembers. Today I'm remembering Magic the Gathering. Uh, I think it feels really appropriate to do this now, especially with the new Dominaria set coming out. Uh, in some ways, from what I see, it appears to be kind of a return to form, or at least return to the roots of Magic. And the set looks to be much more significant in terms of flavor and in uh, power than Ixalan and Omnicat. And I'm really interested. I plan on doing regular drafting um, with this set coming out. Something I've not done since my local comic store at the time closed, which is around the original Ravnica block. More on my hiatus for Magic in a bit later. But I want to go down memory lane uh, right now and talk about what originally drew me to the game, and what my experience have been playing it, and what little life lessons I've learned. So I started playing around 1997. Um, I was in middle school at the time, and I was really drawn to the medieval high fantasy aesthetic of it. Now I had no idea how to play it and the manuals you'd get, those little manuals, they were really no help. Um, well they were a little help. They told me the basics of the game but I still had tons of questions and there weren't really many people around to ask. Um, but I collected and bought these cards mostly for the little snippets of story on these cards and the flavor. Uh, and of course the art. My favorite artists being uh, then and now uh, Rebecca Gay because I love her work on the Homelands comic, and really every single card that she's ever done was a masterpiece. I also really love the work of Margaret Organ Keen. Um, of course, her Autumn Willow was a favorite of mine, always has been. Uh, Daughter of Autumn as well, Tarpan. If I can fit Tarpan in any way into a deck, I try to put it in there, because I just love the uh, art with those horses. Just beautiful. Uh, of course, Christopher Rush, uh, one of my favorite uh, cards and most played cards, Order of the Ivan Hand. I always make sure it's the Christopher Rush art. Uh, love Blood and the Martyr as well, and of course, I don't own it, but Black Lotus had to say it. Uh, Randy Absland, his Ivan Praetor was uh, an old favorite. Susan Van Comps howling uh, him to Turok art is another favorite, so when I play him, it's usually with that art. Um, so I think I may have given it away a little bit, but my two favorite sets were uh, Fallen Empires and Homelands. Um, I think Homelands, and it's going to sound controversial, but I think Homelands actually aged a bit better over time than uh, Fallen Empires um, for a lot of reasons. I don't want to get too, too into it, but uh, Fallen Empires had some power cards in it, but they were common, which is odd. It was a very small set as well, too. Whereas Homelands, there were... Oh, I'm trying to think. Were there power cards? Well, Didgeridoo, that card aged really nicely now, thanks to Minotaurs. Um, Memory Lapse, of course, Baron Sand Gear, but that should cost six. Even then, I thought it was a little much. Uh, Autumn Wheel is great, but anyway, um, both those sets are old favorites of mine. Um, I also, at the time, bought a lot of Ice Age, Portal, 4th and 5th edition. I also really appreciated Chronicles as well. Uh, I know Chronicles is a very unpopular set for a lot of reasons. Um, however, joining the game in 97 that I wanted to play with the older, older cards, Chronicles was my best bet to get at a lot of them, so I bought Chronicles as well. Now, being brand new to the game and not having a lot of people around that played it at the time, I had a lot of misconceptions, I had a lot of misunderstandings about how the game was played. For example, I thought everything was affected by summoning sickness. I thought I couldn't tap lands until they were in play for a turn, I thought I couldn't tap artifacts until they were in play for a turn. Um, and I thought the point of the game was to be very drawn out and very slow. So that made sense in my weird uh, newbie mind that everything would, you know, take forever to do anything with. I also thought that um, regeneration worked differently. I thought regeneration you can activate if a creature's in the graveyard and it would put it back into play. I know the rulebook said that wasn't the case. Um, nothing on the card indicated that that was the case, but flavor-wise it just made sense to me that it would work like that. I also, at the time, remember thinking that the bigger your deck was, the better it was. I noticed in the rule book it only said that the limit was, I think, 40 cards for a deck. Or maybe at that time they changed it to 60. Maybe they, it was changed to 60 at the time. But anyway, there was no maximum uh, recommendation. So I thought, okay, if I have a massive deck of, of hundreds of cards, I'll be ready for anything. Uh, no matter what my opponent has, I'll have an answer for it somewhere in my deck. And that was another misconception, too, the idea of playing a deck with just answers to possible threats instead of playing a deck full of threats. Um, there was a player, I can't remember who, but it's been said that, you know, there is no wrong 
threat. There is no wrong question in magic. There's only wrong answers. And uh, I definitely felt that years later uh, when I would be playing with my uh, massive deck with uh, cards that have hate on uh, blue and hate on red and my opponents playing mono white or something. I also used to think that um, damage on creatures stayed. So if a creature took two damage and has a five toughness, I thought it would be down to a three toughness until it would die for the remainder of the game. Um, when I found out that wasn't the case, the game became so much more uh, so much more clear. Uh, I also remember thinking that mana source meant permanent. So I remember having him, uh, not him, um, dark rituals. Some of them said interrupt. Some of them said uh, mana source. And I thought the ones that were mana sources were treated differently. So I thought they were like permanents. They would stay in play. And I thought I'd tap one black to add three black to my mana pool whenever I want. Um, that was not the case. Dark Ritual is a fantastic card, but not that fantastic. That, that would just be broken. Um, I also remember at the time thinking that card advantage was overrated. Um, I didn't understand the point of cards that had you draw cards. It seemed kind of redundant. I remember thinking as a new player that, you know, I could have a bunch of awesome cards in my deck. Or I could just put a bunch of cards in my deck that allow me to draw cards to hopefully get the awesome cards. Just seemed unnecessary. Just draw the awesome card in the first place. Duh. Yeah, no, I, I, that was really boneheaded. But the thing is, I didn't get to pressure test my theories and learn until high school. And this is really the first major life lesson that Magic taught me in high school, was to learn from my mistakes. So, I enter high school, freshman year, I see some kids playing Magic at the uh, table uh, before class starts. And uh, in the cafeteria we're playing, and I bring in my 200 card deck. Um, I remember one of my uh, classmates asked me, okay Mike, uh, is that, how many decks is that? You know, thinking I was going to find them up. I'm like, oh no, it's all one. And they're like, okay... And uh, turn one, you know, they play, a, I don't know what it was, a, we'll say Forest and Land War Elves, and they tell me go. And I say, okay, I draw a card, I discard a card, I tell them go. <laughs> and they're like, okay, what's going on? So I don't play my first land until like turn three, and uh, I realize that bigger isn't always better. Um, now, I didn't win a single game until my sophomore year in high school. I lost Monday through Friday. Every day that I was in school, every day of my freshman year and first half of sophomore year, just getting pummeled and beaten repeatedly. Um, but this was not a bad thing because every defeat I was learning something new. And I had a lot to learn. So, for example, I remember thinking that Necropotence, uh, I love the art, always have, but I thought Necropotence was a garbage card at the time when I first cracked it. And I remember one day running across someone who used an old school Suicide Black deck on me. Uh, with a Necropotence. And uh, I realized, oh shoot, it's a good card, and oh shoot, card advantage is actually pretty sweet, especially when you're running a really fast deck. Um, I also used to think that life gain was a fantastic strategy. Um, life gain has gotten much better over the years, but it's still not great in and of itself because it doesn't change the board, uh, nor necessarily get you any closer to winning. I mean, there are some situations where it's really good, so... If I'm playing my burn deck and someone's playing life gain, that can be really annoying for me to deal with. But more often than not, if you're just playing life gain for the sake of gaining life, you're just delaying the inevitable. Um, so I remember playing a life gain deck, and I just got beaten repeatedly. Uh, also, by getting defeated again and again, I learned the value of instants and interrupts. Uh, I, of course, I learned that they're basically the same thing. Uh, that was another misconception I had at the time, but... From playing, I learned how important it was to play stuff during your opponent's turn. I remember playing, and my opponents playing things during my combat, or at the end of my turn. And At first, I thought they were cheating. At first, I was like, you can't do that. That's not your turn. And they're like, yeah, instant, you can play whenever you want. And I was like, oh, you can? So I started, you know, I would emulate better players, and that's how I got better. And that's when I started really appreciating uh, instants. Some of my favorites at the time were... Uh, cards like Giant Growth, Unsummon, Swords to Plowshares, and Righteousness and Disenchant. Uh, those were solid favorites. I really enjoyed them. I also learned that bigger didn't always mean better when it came to cards. I remember having a green-black deck I was really proud of. I actually had a strategy to it for once. It wasn't just a kitchen sink deck of stuff thrown together. It had 
black for the sake of removal for removing little creatures and little threats and for mana acceleration with my dark rituals to put out my big big green stompy creatures and then just dominate and beat face with them i thought it was perfect i remember actually using it and my opponent seeing my scaled worm hit the table saying great that's awesome terror and uh hmm yeah that's when i realized the value of cards like auto willow or cards that you put to help protect your big creatures so yeah but hey uh sophomore year i got better and by the time i was a senior in high school from learning and you know doing my homework as well too reading in quest magazine and whatnot i got really good um so good in fact i was probably one of the best players in my high school uh at the time i graduated so going into college i thought i was hot shit now when i went to college they uh asked us to fill out a survey um asking us what hobbies do you have and for my hobby i had of course the top magic gathering i loved the game i was good at it so freshman year i had a roommate who also played magic uh however he was really really good uh he competed regularly at friday night magic and other competitions uh he was ranked um he was mostly played extended but also played standard as well and here i was just some kid who threw together a deck and was able to get the better of my uh, classmates in high school and that's about it so uh, i also apologize for your sirens in the background i am near a firehouse but anyway um this is where I learned my another life lesson, that no matter how good you are, there is always someone better. So be humble and always help and encourage new players. So, yeah, he uh, played extended. His one of his favorite decks was a classic Psychotog uh, deck, and it would just obliterate anything and anything I could come up with. Um, at this time, I do remember feeling a bit discouraged about Magic. I was not as good as I thought I was. Um, also, the game was starting to change from the game that I knew when I was younger. Um, the borders changed. The frames changed. Uh, I remember the artifact cards changed color completely from brown to off-white, and that made them really confusing to sort. They eventually, you know, they soon learned their lesson and made them gray, but still I hate, and to this day I hate, and will still whine and whine and bitch about these new frames. I hate them so much it doesn't look like a magic card it looks like anyway um the game also got ridiculously a lot faster i mean there were some there were some uh sets in the past that were pretty bonkers i remember like uh, urza saga uh was pretty nuts but damn the mirrodin block was really stupid um for how fast the game got and i hated it i hated it for uh making the game uh stupid fast i hated it for also the flavor of it it was so alien so foreign to the aesthetic that drew me into the game you know in middle school i wasn't really playing magic i was collecting and reading the cards because i really liked the classic medieval flair and this i had I, you know the, i don't know what it was it was just techno magic it wasn't magic at all actually it was nuts and bolts uh you know i really would have hated uh the game and quit if it wasn't for uh, my roommate, who, even though he beat the heck out of me again and again at Magic, always encouraged me. Uh, he was very good at doing the turd sandwich thing, you know. When you give feedback, start with something positive, then something negative, and then something you can work on for next time. And I was always doing that. Um, he also introduced me to different formats of Magic. I didn't have to play with the new cards. I could still play with my older cards in other formats. Um, so... I didn't really want to play standard because I hated the Mirrodin block so much. Um, so I played a lot of uh, extended. I made a classic uh, Madness deck with his help. Also a classic Suicide Black deck, which I actually had a lot of the cards already I needed for it. So I would use those decks and I would actually be able to be, you know, have some more competitive matches against my roommate and other people. Um, seeing my skills improve, I felt encouraged and I went to, I guess, the next step. In my uh, little experience with Magic Gathering, and that was actually competing at Friday Night Magics and going and doing drafting. Uh, drafting appealed to me a lot because, um, you know, my collection is pretty sizable, but, you know, I can only do so much with the cards I have. Uh, with drafting, everyone's on an equal playing field. You know, you crack boosters and you make the most of what you have. So 
that really appealed to me. Also, too, the set at the time, uh, once I started drafting, was uh, Kamigawa. Um, the flavor, again, was different than what I preferred, but it was much more down-to-earth than the crap that was mirrored in. Um, I, again, I apologize if you like Mirrodin. I own a affinity deck now because I use it whenever I absolutely possibly want to win or beat someone. I don't like using it. I feel dirty using it, as one should. But, yeah. Anyway, I started drafting around Kamigawa. And, uh, you know, it was a weird thing. I've been playing Magic for years and years, but I was brand new to drafting. I was brand new to Friday Magic and competing at this local comic store, uh, I was very nervous. And I have to admit, I was a bit insecure as well. You know, I really didn't want to be perceived as a noob because I've been playing for a long time, even though I had no idea what I was doing with drafting. Um, so I was a bit awkward uh, in how I played. And uh, other players can sense it. Uh, some players really preyed on that, actually, unfortunately. A lot of these players saw my obvious nervousness and would try to take advantage of that. Uh, some people tried to shark me with some really unequal trades. And then when I would say no, because even though I'm new to drafting, I'm not new to you know what's a good card and what's not, or what's a card that's likely to you know hold its value and what won't. Um, you know, they would then grief me about it. Oh, well, you know, you, that card's okay, but you really should... Uh, if you really want to get good at this game, you should look at cards like this. You know, crap like that. I'm like, fuck's sake. So that's really souring my experience. Uh, thankfully, not all the other people were like that. or a lot of people that played that actually enjoyed the game. And this here is where I learned another life lesson. Um, if you're not having fun doing what you're choosing that you're doing, why are you choosing to do it? So if you're not having fun playing Magic, for example, uh, why the hell are you playing it in the first place? You know, uh, I think I went in with the mindset of I want to go in, I want to compete, and I want to win. And I was putting a condition on my fun. I was not going to have fun until I won. Which meant, especially as a new player in a new format, I was not going to have fun. And that was really no one else's fault but mine. That was my mindset. Um, so I kept, I kept with it. And I learned from my mistakes, again, like how I did in high school. Um... For example, I remember letting an opponent take a move back. And then later in that very next match, when I wanted to take a move back, and it was very similar to what he did, uh, him just flat refusing, no, you can't. And I learned never, ever, ever let my opponent take a move back again. Unless, of course, we're doing casual or if I'm teaching a new player. But yeah, in draft, Friday Magic, no, don't do that. Uh, I also remember how... I've got to this point by learning and emulating what other players do. And I noticed that the players who were the most successful at a Friday Night Magic were the most relaxed. They were not the hyper-aggressive uh, types. But during games, you know, they would crack the occasional joke or make a funny comment about a card on the field or, you know, ask how I'm doing before and after. We would have a little conversation as we're shuffling. Um, and it wasn't meant to be a you know, there were some players that would do that, and it was obviously meant to draw my attention away from what they're doing, and I, I could tell. But no, there were players there that were generally there to have fun, and the ones who were generally there and generally having fun, even when they lost, were still coming out, you know, smiling and having a great time. And more often than not, they were the ones winning the, you know, the booster box and the rewards afterward. So the ones who were most successful were the most relaxed, and I realized, okay, if I want to be successful and have a good time, I gotta relax, and one thing I can do is, you know, maybe crack the occasional joke about cards when they hit the uh, table. Um, you know, give them little nicknames. Uh, you know, talk to my opponent a little more before and after, because I was, you know, my hand was shaking, I was stone cold silent, and that makes for a very awkward playing experience for my opponent too, even if they are on the up and up. So I started becoming more relaxed. Uh, I enjoyed making my opponent, you know, laugh before and after. Uh, got in the routine of, you know, being the one to initiate shaking hands as well at the end of a match, win or lose, I was really happy to play the game, and as I did, I felt more comfortable. Uh, I felt more comfortable doing things like asking a judge for clarification on a rule that I didn't understand before bumbling my way into it and then making up excuses as to why I did it and being hypersensitive. I also felt more comfortable asking judges for clarification when I felt my opponent wasn't doing something um, correct. 
and I didn't take it personal. Um, and uh, yeah, my uh, play in drafting as I relaxed got better. And, you know, it was a weird thing. It was like when I stopped becoming so obsessed with trying to win and trying to be number one all the time, I started winning more. You know, weird thing. Um, don't get me wrong, I love winning, but once I didn't make my fun or my happiness conditional upon winning, I started winning a lot more. It's pretty neat. Um, the next block I drafted a lot of was Ravnica, the original Ravnica block, and that was really cool too. Um, I really enjoyed that block, and things were going really good. Until the store um, that I was drafting at met the fate that so many other comic stores meet, they go out of business. And uh, with that, you know, I was done with college. Um, my circle that I was playing with, uh, you know, they were all from out of the area, and the place we'd meet closed. Uh, I really didn't play much Magic anymore, so... More or less, I kind of retired from the game, and I, uh, you know, a couple years later, I moved. And that brings us right on to about the present day. Um, around the Kaladesh block, I started to return back to the game. This was mostly due to there being an actual magic community up where I'm now living. Uh, this is also due in large part to the discovery of magic YouTubers. Uh, some of my favorites being Tolarian Community College. Uh, and I really relate to those old man videos. I really wish there was more of them. Um, you know, his video on banding or his video on Planeswalkers, I feel that so much. I also love Open Boosters and Alpha Investments as well. Uh, links to those in my description if you haven't already checked them out. But you probably have if you found your way to my video. You probably are familiar with these people. Uh, you know, all three of them enjoy disparate, different aspects of the game. And I think what makes it so enjoyable to watch their videos is they're very passionate and Rudy from Alpha Investments could sometimes be a little little, uh, little grumpy, but still, they're all passionate about different aspects of the game. I think that's what makes them so fun to watch. Um, anyway, the game uh, has changed a lot in a lot of ways from what I remember. I mean, the uh, frames and borders, they still suck. They really do. Um, the game is still ridiculously fast as well. Uh, extended format is no longer a thing, so a lot of my decks that I had made for it, I can't really do much with them, because they're too old, unfortunately. Uh, modern is a bit too modern for a lot of the decks that I have. Uh, thankfully, though, there is another format that I really enjoy, and that's Pauper. That became a thing, and I really want that to grow. Um, there's also a new Mythic Rarity, which seems a little unnecessary to me, but whatever. Um, especially since I don't really see a much... With Mythic, a lot of Mythic cards, I don't see a great deviation in power or significance between them and, say, rare cards. Maybe I'm not just not seeing it, but anyway. Uh, and Planeswalker cards, which I really hate for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to get into that now. But just they're stupid. I, I hate Planeswalkers a lot. Um, what other things have changed? Well, oh, uh, Miri Cat Warrior, uh, one of my favorite characters. Uh, Apparently at some point became a vampire. And uh, speaking of vampires, there was not one, but two blocks, uh, they returned to it apparently, of werewolves and vampires. And no one freaking told me. Um, I would be more bitter if I missed it. And it was a return to Ogratha block. Ogratha being the um, plane that Homelands is set on. But still, um, the game has changed quite a bit um, from what I remember. And the flavor is... Again, not what I would like it to be. It just started going off in its own very odd, high, high, high magic uh, direction. Uh, not a lot of classic fantasy uh, there. Um, however, there's some things in magic that tells me that the people of Wizards are paying attention to old farts like me and are giving us you know, little nods here and there. So, for example, fixing the Legends cards. Uh, no, not by the new rule. I mean by actually going back and giving them the creature types that they should have. So, for example, Baron Sangir is now thankfully a vampire, and they did it with all of them. Uh, Veldrain of Sangir is now a human rogue. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know whether or not Veldrain is actually a name or what, because the card is Veldrain of Sangir, and I'm probably the only one in the world that cares. But I really want to know, is Veldrain a title? Like, Mayor of Sangir? Or is it his name, like... Paul of Sengir, you know, I, I don't know, I really want to know. Um, I was also really, really happy to see that 
Irini Sangir is now a vampire dwarf. Um, I mean, she always was in the uh, lore, but I was really happy that Watsi, or Wizards of the Coast, uh, took the time to do that and do it right. Um, so little things like that tell me that they still care about their roots. So that prevents me from completely leaving the uh, game from you know up, up entirely. Um, that and how it's played. Because it plays very similarly in nature to how it always has. Um, when I play Magic, it's more of a nostalgia trip. And even though the frames are different, and I hate them, really do, um, even though a lot of the creature types have changed, um, I still play it, you know, to feel like a kid again. And I still do. Um, I would like to see a little more of a return to form. You know, if they're going to keep the borders, and I, you know, it's been how many years now, they probably are keeping the borders, but I can't get over it. I'm sorry. But I really miss wizards that actually look like wizards. And I miss demons that actually look like the friggin' devil. Please, I actually want a little more Satanism in my game again. I know it sounds weird, but it's badass. Um, I also hate the uh, new logo, so I would like them to change the logo, please. Um, but anyway, Dominaria is coming back. There's a lot of Dominaria that tells me that they remember the roots. There's little nods to uh, Fallen Empires in the cards. There's nods to the Brothers War. There's nods to... Um, there's uh, some old Planeswalkers are coming back as well. Classic Planeswalkers are returning. Um, so I'm very excited for Dominaria. Um, the direction of Wizards is also, I think, overall very good. Uh, Wizards has been making a very visible and conscientious effort to be more inclusive and diverse in its player base, and I really appreciate that. I really do, because it helps the game grow, and it helps the game survive and live. I mean, back when I was playing uh, Magic, or back when I first started playing Magic, or at least collecting, I couldn't find anyone to play. And you know, now today, it seems like every other twenty-something has a deck, and or at least heard of Magic, and you know, at least had or has cards. Um, yeah, and again, I'm really excited for the upcoming Dominaria set. Dominaria right now couldn't be any more welcome. Almost. Um, again, I really hate those borders, and I would love to see Tim, you know, classic Tim, right smack on the front of the uh, booster boxes. But forward to drafting it. And uh, that's about it. Thank you all for listening and coming with me on my trip down memory lane. This is Jagtagger93 signing out. Have a good one.